society to serve the well-being of markets. And so um, the agenda we're, we're thinking about to shift this is, is how do we shift the ideas that underpin about how we think about the economy and thus inform how we have economic policy conversations. We need to shift power and check power in the economy where it's become concentrated and to build power among those who've lacked voice like workers and communities of color. And then finally, to the topic of today, we need to shift the rules, rules that uh, put guardrails on market activity, regulations that shape how investors and companies make decisions. And I think that's why we're excited for today's conversations to have been uh, a group of leaders who've been championing a policy agenda from different perspectives that can bring about structural change to, uh, to our economy. R rules, I think, is, 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 is the key, as you said, key, one of the key words for today in the sense of um, you know, a media network known as a, known as Investor Impact Alpha, covering investing in, in a lot of ways. But this is really about rules and policy, and frankly, government and 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 sort of democracy. So um, um, the other, there were, I was I was ask you why rules. I also wanted to ask you why now. Like ha, like this is about mobilize harnessing. You know, this mobilization that's underway. This economy. This this administration. Um, this year. I mean, this is this is not some um, you know poly sci a class for the future. This is about right now, right, Chris? It is right now. I th we think we have a real policy window with the Biden administration with the kind of bold economic policy agenda being put forward. Um, there's things that can be done legislatively. There's lots that can be done by regulators within their existing authorities. And we hope to, to get into some of this. Um, a bunch of policy domains, but a few where we think there's possible for, for movement and are really important are you know, one corporate governance, the shifting corporate governance incentives from preferencing shareholders to balancing the interests of stakeholders, workers, local communities, investors of all sorts. Um, shifting how we define and measure value creation by companies from uh, a system that just looks at financial profits to a world in which uh, we measure positive and negative impacts on people and planet and business and corporations make decisions based on uh, that holistic um, understanding of, of value creation. Um, a third is reforms on our capital markets, right? And differentiating, creating stronger incentives towards capital markets, doing what they're supposed to do, to deploy investment to productive innovation in the real economy and not financialization, speculation, and essentially financial transactions that extract from, from workers and, uh, and generate uh, fees for, for Wall Street firms. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, a holistic set of policies that address equity and inclusion. We need to acknowledge that the current economic system, the current version of shareholder capitalism has perpetuated racial inequity and reinforced white supremacy and excluded black and brown people from opportunity in all parts of the economy. And so the policy agenda we, we need needs to dismantle structural barriers and remedy past injustices and create pathways for, for everyone. And so um, the panelists that follow are the real experts in all of this. Um, so that's my tee up, and let's let's get into this. Great, thanks. That, that, there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack there, which which we will now proceed proceed to do. But let's bring Leo in, and, and Chris stay stay engaged here, because um, I just wanted to Leo. Um, uh, I actually recovered you as a reporter, as you know, about 20 years ago, and you were the chief judge of the Chancery Court. I think then became the chief judge of the Supreme Court, and in Delaware, as folks know, most corporations are are based there, and so you're sort of the chief judge of corporations where you were in, 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 in that career. So we are delighted to have you here. And I want you to set just a, a little bit of a historical context of how big a shift we're talking about. I mean, if in, in terms of, of this, uh, if this, 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 this change that's going on, and again, not just as calls from activists or advocates or whatnot, but actually a kind of changing structure of corporations and capitalism that capitalism needs or that corporations themselves need. Um, so just give us the big, the big swing and, and, and then we'll get into some of the specifics. No, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna, I have lots of specifics as you know, David, and, and I hope you guys can share, you know, some my paper, especially my Roosevelt paper, gang, which has a lot of very specifics, but I, I do want to focus big picture because I think there's a real danger to overestimate the power of rules in corporate law, as opposed to the real power dynamics, I think that Chris was talking about. And what I want to say about that is there's not much about Delaware corporate law or American corporate law that has changed from, say, 1965. And 1965, there was um, workers got a much bigger share, CEOs were paid less same corporate law rules. What's changed? There's two arrows. Arrow of the stock market and the power of institutional investors hugely going up. 
the hour of workers and other stakeholders hugely going down, really starting in 1980 with the uh, election of Ronald Reagan, who adopted Friedmanite policies. It, and what has happened is, even if there's room, and there is room within corporate law to consider the interest of other stakeholders, the reality is that as the, uh, the famous song Summertime Blues talks about, if you don't have the vote, nobody's gonna help you. And the only one who has the vote in, in, in our system is um, institutional investors. A lot of what we need is a truth and reconciliation commission among our institutional investor community who has pushed managed to the market policies for 40 years. Larry Fink is not on the vanguard of history, no pun intended vanguard, of, of, of starting to talk about these things. That's because society, the, the fabric is starting to fray and the elites knew it. I'm a big fan of Jamie Dimon. His company is a very big employer in Delaware. They give a lot of money, charity, they pay well. But the business roundtable was reacting not to, to a thing. So one of the things we have to deal with, and I would urge this group, is we have to deal with the real power dynamics in corporate governance. That doesn't mean there can't be rule changes, but the rule changes need to be direct, directed more than just at the companies that make products, real products, and deliver real services. They primarily have to be addressed to institutional investors themselves. Because we don't have any stock buybacks if the institutions didn't want them. We didn't have a lower worker share if the institutions didn't want them. And the reality is we have spread the investor class, but it's still not representative. And so the distribution, every time you shift from workers to, to stockholders, you're moving money to the top 1% from everyone else. This is, by the way, had a huge effect on racial inequality. When the Great Society New Deal consensus was in effect, uh, black people were making gains. But black people, people forget, Chief Justice Roberts ignores this all the time. Black people didn't get labor rights until the late 1960s. History doesn't work that fast. You can't just get rid of 400 years of discrimination. But there was a closing of the gap. When the gain sharing with workers went down, who did that affect predominantly? It affects those who are trying to climb the ladder. That disproportionately hurt black people. So one of the things to keep in mind is the best thing that corporate America and corporations can do for black people in the United States is to pay all people um, a better wage. That will be a non-racially specific way of reducing inequality because it will have a disproportionately beneficial impact on black people. Public-private divide can't have this conversation and make it all about public companies. And we can't have public policy that just puts more disclosure responsibilities in order to disclosure public, on public companies and then leave out private companies. Private company wealth has grown because of exemptions from the securities laws. They need to be subject to the same, I call it form EESG. I would also I'll tell you, we need to add an E for employees and stop burying them in the S. But you need to deal with the public private divide or you would just close the window even more by unintentionally, by, by trying to have more disclosure, you'll just encourage more going private. So you've got to deal with the power dynamics and that means the institutional investors have to be regulated. They have to have the same ESG responsibilities and disclosure responsibilities of companies and you have to cover large private companies. On the left, by the way, we need to unite the pour over coffee left. I see Michael and David, you out there and, and you know the, what I mean, the pour over coffee, the shops in, in Oakland and Berkeley where it's not fancy enough to go to Pete's, you have to go to some place and they pour you four, four ounces of something. It costs 12 bucks. You know, pour over coffee left that talks about the climate needs to meet a worker from a union one time. We cannot go forward on climate and leave behind the people who are in the energy sector. I have a car, I take planes once in a while, I use energy. Frankly, the pour over coffee left uses much more energy per person than almost any class in society, except the people who go to Davos and Bill Gates. And, and so if we don't bring to everybody together uh, on the same journey and we demonize people, we're gonna divide things. Corporate political spending. This is something institutional investors can control and shut down. The, the power dynamic for stakeholders has gone down profoundly in part because corporate money now is poured into our politics. It makes it a gantlet to run for any public policy. And institutional investors need to demand, frankly, that corporate political spending be subject to a plan. And, and that subject can't be ignored in, in, in the process. So those are my big picture points. I, I would, there are many specific things. I would urge us to focus on the practical. 
for example, don't just talk about, if you want to talk about workers on boards, you better be know about co-determination and you better know it's about more than workers on boards and that it involves works councils and that the unions and the works councils provide informational bases. You have to know that there are, these are smaller geographic countries, that there's specific ratios. If we want to make progress, we could do something like a workforce committee as a building block to that and get more voice into non-union companies by a trustworthy process and frankly, make a board unit accountable for all HR policies and working policies. And so that executive pay has to be situated within that, make a board committee responsible for things like DEI, pay equity, uh, living wage, contractor policies, and um, me too. But we're, we're, we can't be impractical and, and things like just chucking out we're going to do workers on boards. One, it's not going to pass. And two, if, if you haven't done the hard work of thinking through things, let's do the things that are there. And we know that good disclosure on workforce and climate in concert, not in sequence, that makes sense. Making sure that all the private companies and the institutional investors have to do that and have everybody pull in the direction, that direction makes sense. Moving towards the benefit corporation model makes sense because it would put us in alignment. That's a shall duty towards stakeholders. And by the way, that would bring us into alignment with our OECD colleagues who are more stakeholder oriented. We may have to do it by incentives first, like contracting or procurement incentives at the federal level, but those things we can all do. And the Biden administration, I think is geared up to do it. And the good thing is the Biden administration, I'll finish with this, is internationalist. They recognize the value of international um, uh, relations. The New Deal in our country was in many ways the creation of a regulatory structure to govern the full extent of the economy that had grown. We didn't have a, a, a regulatory structure, uh, David, to deal with the entire American economy, even though it was a 50 state wide economy. Things like the EU are doing in the European Union. We now need to knit together because we have globalized the power of mobilized capital, but we didn't globalize the power of working people and of the environment. And the only way we can do that is to build on our common value with our allies and to try to cohere in things like disclosure and principles that we all share, and then to extend them in a geographically relevant way to developing nations. Well, that's, that's terrific, Leo. And, 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 and you saved me from having to, to, to ask the questions because you answered so many of the points I was going to raise. But let me just call out a couple of things that, so people can, can get their heads around. One, um, EESG, not just ESG, for the E for employees. Um, and then, and then you, you, you talked about, um, yeah, and I'll say David, why that's important is it's not coincidental. No, frankly, institutional investors, I've been pushing for since uh, for 20 years for institutional investors to start thinking about sustainability, particularly index funds, and particularly about the fact that for most, for 99% of Americans, uh, more of your wealth is attributable to your access to a good job than it is to your investments. So unless we have an economy that treats workers fairly, it's not gonna help the investor class either. Well, that, They've so, been so, slow so, on that. They've been slow on that. And part of it is ESG relegates the workers to the S. You didn't hear about living wages. You didn't hear about contractors. It took frankly took 2020, Brexit, the election of Donald Trump to give that salience. So I think actually, if you also wanna to bring together the environmental left and the worker left in a coherent way, I think it's good to put that E up front. And because one thing we know is that every company, you can't be a good corporate citizen unless you're good to the people who are most responsible for your success, that's your worker. And we know that every company has an effect on the environment. So if we focus on those two things, and by the way, that E for employees would then cover things like DEI, Me Too, because you can't be a good employer without being inclusive and respectful. Um, I think that sometimes nomenclature actually matters in terms of, of, of saliency. And so that's why I harp on that. Yeah, and, and, and then just to drive it home, this, this gain sharing and this fair gain sharing and literally yeah. a struggle, but um, um, in the, uh, over the share of profits that go to shareholders. Exactly, and, exactly. and if you look at workers. the, I mean, if the thing is there's been, there's people argue, um, Peter Thiel, very bright guy, but he said, you know, the problem is there's not enough, there's not been enough new pie. And that's just not true. The reality is there's been plenty of new pie in the American economy. It's just that the share of the pie and the new pie that's eaten by the elites has gone way up. You know, we're not making changes. I'm sorry, I don't want to burst the bubble of anybody at Apple, but the newest iPhone is not as transformational as the refrigerator or a car or, you know, in, in indoor plumbing. 
but we're making, there's been plenty of gains in productivity and the American workforce has never been more educated and capable of retraining than now. But what's happened, David, is the share that they're getting has changed profoundly. And so it's really a question of gain sharing. And I think one of the things we can do of people as a community of people who concentrate on this stuff is if you actually fix that gain sharing and just restore it or come close to restoring what it used to be, and you spread the blessings of our market system, you, you have all kinds of, of benefits. Frankly, you expand the investor class, you help close the wealth gap, you disproportionately help black people, which addresses racial inequality. But the other thing is important is there's a lot of struggling white communities out there that demagogues appeal to. And they use the other, as you know, David, to blame the other for their frustration. If the change in gain sharing, if we go back to a fair distribution, that's gonna help those communities too. That's gonna build the, the center of our society. That's gonna uh, minimize the ability of people to divide us on, on, on grounds that are irrational and immoral. And so I think I, for every ad I see in the New York Times by a company on a one-off basis, I'd like to know what are they doing to, you know, treat their workforce fairly? What are they doing to their contracted workforce? Yes, yes. Those people who may clean their building. Do they have a living wage policy at the company, but not as to their contractors? Do, are they promoting middle management? Are they going to, frankly, not just historically black colleges, but public universities, uh, community colleges, and, 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 and recruiting at the places where ordinary Americans are, 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 are graduating and where people of limited means are getting their first opportunity. Those are the things, if corporate America treats its workers well, gives everybody an equal opportunity and shares those blessings, that's gonna be a, its hugest contribution along with being environmentally responsible. And, but they can't do that, I'll finish, unless the institutional investors um, support them doing that. And in fact, the institutional investors have squeezed and squeezed and have wanted workers to be squeezed so that stockholders could benefit. And that has perverse results. And we can't, so and what I'm saying about the truth and reconciliation, this is a group thinking about what you can do from an investing standpoint to some extent, is look within your own community and make sure that you're being willing to be accountable and that you're aligning your G policies. That's the other thing, David, a lot of the G policies still are very managed to the market and nobody's evolved those as they've talked woke about workers or they talk woke about the environment. They still have policies that really are, let's make companies um, manage to the thermometer of the stock market. Okay. Um, so I probably said too much as, and I wanna to listen to this great array of folks that you've said. And thank great, you, David, thank, for inviting me. Thank you, Leo. And there's a, and there's a, a natural segue here. Um, I just wanna send people to uh, something called the Fair and Sustainable Capitalism Act that Leo's worked on that has a lot of these planks in it and, and you can read more about it. And as you said, the Roosevelt Institute um, uh, hosted some of that. So, um, but let's bring in Michael and, and Mahalat um, from PolicyLink, which out here in, in the Bay Area is, is, is an institution that uh, has been around for, for several decades and, 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 and has a, had a, a big effect on, on many of the debates. And, and Michael, um, uh, the, this, this, um, what, what Leo was saying about um, lifting uh, black people and uh, 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 in income inequality as a way of, of, of driving economic prosperity for all, there's, a, there's a, 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 a thing you guys have educated me on, the curb cut effect. Um, can, you, can you maybe just explain what that is and draw, and draw the connection? Absolutely, thank you for having me. And um, Leo, thank you for your remarks. Um, they were powerful and they really um, illuminated what the curb cut effect is. Um, the curb cut effect describes really the process of um, when you tend to the needs of the most vulnerable, um, you end up experiencing cascading benefits to, to everyone. You know, when we think about those sidewalk cut indentations, um, you know, that came from folks in Berkeley who had different physical challenges for more than 40 years ago who were advocating to be able to access moving around in their community unencumbered. And today, those of us who travel a lot use them. Those FedEx, UPS employees with those carts use them um, to traverse the sidewalks. So that's what we're really trying to get people to tend to, thinking about folks who are not, often not seen in community and how do we benefit them? And the curb cut effect and what Leo's remarks signal is something quite powerful. The reality, and even what Chris was saying, 
The reality is, hold this number, 100 million plus in this nation. 100 million folks economically insecure. That's one in three. 40 plus million are white, to Leo's point, about there is significant white pain. And so while the economy is booming, if we were to talk about a results-based conversation instead of being ideologues, we would see that we're leaving more than 100 million people behind. And the curb cut effect would call us to design a world that is just and fair, starting with that 100 million and making sure that they can move into the middle class and beyond. So you've got the, the what you, I think you call the racial equity governing agenda. Um, and uh, as Leo said, there's lots of particulars in this and it's always, but I'd, I'd love to dive into some particulars. I mean, what is on the racial governing, uh, racial equity governing agenda? Well, the, the, the racial equity governing agenda really reflects the equity movement maturing after 22 years. And the racial equity governing agenda is an acknowledgement in our own work at PolicyLink that until you remake the nature and the logic of our governing institutions, you're not gonna see significant progress on that 100 million. Um, charity will not change the life outcomes of that 100 million. It will keep opportunity too random in America. It will mean that I get out of poverty, but my sisters do not. The problems that we're seeing in this nation are a design challenge. It's an int intentional design challenge and we've never tended to it. Think about it to this day. Our government actually holds a very hostile disposition towards black folks and people of color. Think about in Florida, designing an unemployment insurance system to intentionally not work, never thinking you'd be in a pandemic and middle-class folks would need it as well. But they did that because of that anti-black racism that runs through their system, right? That racist trope of the black welfare queen. It's not true, but it has a lot of currency. And so the racial equity governing agenda is an opportunity for movement leaders to say, you know what, just as Grover Northquest significantly changed the nature and logic of the government, we should be able to change the nation and the logic of government to do the thing that it has never done, to actually be able to serve a multiracial democracy. And we started in a couple of areas. First, working to um, enhance that racial equity governing agenda that President Biden put out recently finishing up a, a, a framing document and the assessment tools with McKinsey to make sure that the assessments that the agencies are doing are, will actually be transformative and not a checklist. Working with the Urban Institute to begin to create a racial equity scoring of all significant federal legislation that would rival the CBO scoring. So what you begin to see us do is using the technical tools of democratic governance to do the more adaptive work of asking the federal government, can it can increase its capacity to serve? Can it be more accountable to the 100 million? And can it shift its orientation from simply being charity to tending to the structural designs of the nation? And lastly, I'll give you a real practical example. Take the US Department of Housing and Urban Development work, worked 11 years. HUD puts out a lot of money, billions of dollars in entitlement dollars and CDBG grants, home, HOPWA dollars. They do good work. But you can't continue to do that work, which is charity, and then want to weaken the affirmatively furthering for a housing rule, which is the, the, the anti-discrimination housing law of the land. And so when you hold an institution that holds these two perspectives, a charity orientation and a hostile orientation that really allows dis housing discrimination, you then forfeit the right to ask for results and a return on investment. And so these are things that we're trying to improve in government. Terrific. Let's bring Mahalad in um, um, because you're you have sort of the other hand. You're, now you are a transplant from um, from a, a private sector startup. I think bio, biotech startup, if I remember, um, uh, lawyer, and now jumped into to, to, to policy work, but also to bring CEOs and, and corporates and, and investors um, um, along to this agenda. So, um, tell us about the work you've been doing on the CEO blueprint. Awesome. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. That's exactly right. I'm actually going to start a little bit with um, how I'm here, you know, working with PolicyLink. About nine months ago, I was the general counsel of a healthcare technology company and had my own personal reckoning, realizing that all of these solidarity statements and commitments from the private sector are completely meaningless without an accountability structure. 
and really realized that equity is all of our jobs. As the GC, it's my job to fight for equity and justice. CFOs need to be fighting for equity and justice, and especially CEOs need to be fighting for equity and justice. It's all of our jobs and ended up joining PolicyLink to really define what it looks like, what good looks like in the private sector when it comes to racial equity. So I thought today I'd share a little bit about two areas of our work that are focused on the private sector, but very much complementary to the policy agen agendas discussed by Chris, Leo, and Michael. Um, and my work really focuses on supporting the private sector towards more equitable ways of operating concurrently with fighting for the public policy that we need and that we've all already discussed because we just can't wait for the right public policy that we need. Right now, there's so much attention on racial equity within the private sector and in the minds of investors. And so really developing um, thought leadership and bringing along the private sector is absolutely critical right now. The first piece of work is, as you mentioned, David, the CEO blueprint for racial equity. I'll also talk a little bit about another very important aspect of our work, which is developing performance standards for corporations. We're doing that work with FSG and Just Capital. We're also developing racial equity standards for impact investors with the Global Impact Investing Network and CAPIQ. Now, quickly on the blueprint, we came together last year with FSG and Just Capital to release this report, and it outlines actions and new ways for businesses to operate across 360 degrees of their influence and impact. What we see so often when uh, businesses are talking about racial equity is they think it's just about diversifying their ranks, and maybe uh, appointing one diverse director. It's really everything within their four walls, their supply chains, product development process, governance, and even beyond that within their communities, how are companies showing up? And even beyond that, how are companies showing up at our societal level? Uh, just like Leo and Michael were talking about, we really need corporations to play a more productive role at the national level. Um, and so uh, actions within the company include paying living wages. We've talked a little bit about that already. Um, and a slew of other actions. So tomorrow, the reason why I've been so excited to share the blueprint with you all, knowing that we're talking about reimagined capitalism and the right public policy that we need is because we're releasing an updated blueprint tomorrow. Um, and this 2021 edition builds on all of the work last year, but really focuses on embedding accountability within corporate governance and leadership performance. We also focus a lot on the role that corporations need to play to defend our democracy and play a more productive role in perfecting our multiracial democracy. We know that businesses have outsized power. We've talked about that to shape our laws and regulatory frameworks. And now tomorrow you'll see a whole set of actions really pinpointing exactly what corporations and business leaders ought to do and what they ought to stop doing. Um, this is just the North Star right now. And really the next step of our work is to develop those performance and process standards to really uh, uh, share that, that baseline of what good looks like, embed accountability, and really establish the consistency that we need for how businesses need to approach, measure, disclose, and speak publicly about their equity journeys. This is not in place of the right public policy that we're all talking about today, but needs to happen now while the attention is there and really to get everyone across all sectors marching in the same direction in locked arms. And I know we, we've been talking a long time, so I won't go into too much detail on the work that we're doing with the Global Impact Investing Network, but we are developing racial equity standards for investors um, and we'll be able to share a lot more about the broader private sector standards for corporations and the investor standards later this summer. Thank you, Great. David. Ter terrific, Mahalat. And, and I know one of the things you work on, and, and Fran is, is working on this too, is, is, is part of this is, is the, the particular policies that you say. Part of it is just giving a voice for corporations and investors. And as Leo mentioned, in, in votes and in, in other sorts of things, giving a voice to this, this, this agenda, this broad, broader agenda. And, and Fran, um, you, you're pulling together um, the impact investing crowd, in a sense, around some policy initiatives that can mobilize 
um, more private capital for this agenda, but also just mobilize um, a constituency. And um, um, the, the, the particular thing I'm thinking of is this, this White House task force, which you might want to um, mention, but, um, but, but, but give us the, the, the broad, wh wh why impact investors should care about policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you. So for, I, I feel like I know a lot of you on this call, but for those uh, who I don't know, I'm Fran Siegel. I serve as president of the US Impact Investing Alliance and executive director of the Tipping Point Fund on Impact Investing, which is a grant making donor collaborative uh, supporting the growth of the impact investing field with integrity. Um, yeah, so uh, happy to talk about the White House Initiative on Inclusive Economic Growth proposal, but thought I might start by sharing a little bit about how the Alliance thinks that impact investors have a, a role to play in driving progress um, in stakeholder capitalism, but also transforming community investing practices to combat inequality. So uh, this is an, our emerging theory of change that uh, that that top down structural change is absolutely essential uh, to get to a stakeholder economy and a more equitable society. Uh, but it's 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 insufficient if we don't also revitalize communities from the ground up. And so from a public policy perspective, uh, we support the, the, the public policies that, that, that my fellow speakers have discussed. So I won't uh, uh, itemize those, although um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about ESG disclosure. Uh, we, we haven't really talked about what's happening in, uh, in Europe in that regard, but very excited about uh, the potential for um, syncing up disclosure requirements across jurisdictions. Uh, so that is something I'm trying to think about uh, anything that's incremental to what has already been, been said. I think that that, um, you know, we talked about um, stakeholder governance. We've talked about disclosure uh, among um, both investors and corporations alike. Uh, Leo talked a lot about um, lifting up the role of workers. So we we see this work as absolutely essential and we work in this area on public policy but we also we couple it with uh what we consider to be more bottom-up movement building which uh are around community investing which is where uh impact investors can play a role so these investors as you all know catalyze economic development and opportunity in communities that were otherwise underserved by the broader the incumbent financial system and the connective tissue between stakeholder capitalism and community investing, or more broadly, community revitalization, um, may seem, uh, you know, these may seem a little bit disparate, but they're very, they're inextricably linked in our mind. And we believe that the kind of status quo capitalism that we've been talking about today has had an end, you know, a, a permissive regulatory environment that has led to monopolistic and oligopolistic uh, 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 behavior has really hollowed out our local communities, both urban and rural, uh, black, brown, tribal, and other underserved communities, um, and have hollowed out main streets and given a uh, further rise to this widespread racial and economic uh, disparity. And so we believe that meaningfully investing from the ground up um, in economic revitalization of these underserved communities is absolutely essential. And we think that any strides that we seek to make around stakeholder capitalism um, will be undermined if community priorities around economic development, racial equity, and inclusive economic growth aren't meaningfully prioritized, which um, Michael and Mahalat spoke to so compellingly. Um, Grant, let me just, let me just, because um, um, we're a little bit short of time, I know there's some very specific things that I want folks to know that you're working on. One has to do with the reauthorization of the Community uh, Redevelopment Act. Um, another has to do with CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, which we've been covering very extensively all through the the all through the pandemic and, and, and before that. And then the, the last has to do with the kind of um, domestic um, finance institution um, to, to really drive some some capital. So maybe just can you just tick down the, briefly on, sure. on what folks can do to get involved with those and with you and Yep, yep, I'm happy to. This is the downside of going toward the end. Is that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to steal minutes back from the other speakers um, if I possibly can. So just wanted to talk briefly about, um, you mentioned the proposal on to calling for a White House initiative on inclusive economic growth, and then I'll talk a little bit about community investing policies. So 
We believe the most durable transformational change will happen, must happen at the intersection of government action and private sector partnership. And, um, and, and we believe that private sector behavior change and self-regulation alone will only get us so far. So the US Impact Investing Alliance partnered last year with B-Lab and a coalition of over 50 impact investor and business, or, business organizations, including many on the call today, including PolicyLink uh, as one of our partners, um, are championing a, a policy for a, creating a White House initiative on inclusive economic growth, ideally that would be housed out of the National Economic Council, uh, that would really provide a vehicle for cross-agency and cross-sector coordination that will enable both the administration and Congress to partner more effectively with the private sector to drive the kind of progress toward stakeholder capitalism, uh, inclusive economic growth, community investing that we are talking about. So um, if anybody is interested in learning more about the proposal, you can reach out to the Alliance or to B-Lab, uh, but specifically on some of the policies around community investing, you mentioned the Community Reinvestment Act, which many of you know is a law that um, came into uh, being in 1977 to respond to redlining that requires bank to, banks to equitably serve communities in which they operate. A lot of that money goes to community development finance institutions, CDFIs, and minority depository institutions, MDIs. The CRA was really under attack during the previous administration, but regulators under Biden-Harris and have walked back some of the harmful rules from the OCC, one of the three regulatory um, agencies that, that uh, preside over the, the CRA. And they're also working to put forth a more modernized and strengthened framework. The Alliance in particular, and uh, those in the coalition that work on community investing are really interested in the CRA, getting back to the original tent to more directly address racial disparities, to lift up the essential role the CDFIs and MDIs play you know, as a conduit to, to, to small business lending, and also to modernize CRA to keep pace with uh, the rise of FinTech and other kinds of innovations. Um, so the CRA is key, um, you know, Mahalat and Michael talked about corporate commitments and we have seen at the intersection of stakeholder capitalism and corporate um, corporates, uh, private sector companies starting to fund communities on a voluntary basis. And so one of the things some have called for is a corporate CRA to try to more permanently require companies to serve their community stakeholders in a more um, tangible way. CDFI and small business uh, support um, got a big boost in the omnibus bill at the end of last year, a $9 billion emergency capital investment program, ECIP, to provide equity and equity-like capital to CDFIs and MDIs, which will allow them to lever up and make more uh, loans. And then finally, just on this idea for a domestic development finance facility, kind of a domestic version of uh, the US development uh, DFC, Development Finance Corporation, the idea of creating a, a domestic development finance bank that would support small businesses as critical industry and critical infrastructure as we start thinking a lot in Washington about infrastructure bills, how we how can we position entrepreneurial ecosystems and small businesses, especially in underserved communities as vital um, infrastructure, because we know that entrepreneurship is an essential path to uh, to wealth creation and that uh, black, brown and, and, and women entrepreneurs are starved for for investment capital. Terrific, Fran. Um, um, Remember the, the 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 building blocks here, you guys. Um, it was uh, uh, stakeholders, workers, inclusive, and and then Fran started to get to bottom up. And now I want to turn to Andres Benelli from um, the Center for American Progress to really um, uh, articulate this kind of bottom up idea about economic growth and economic prosperity, because that's kind of been bubbling up here. Which is bring and 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 Michael had had the number, a hundred million people bring. The, you know, everybody up. I, is this really the, are this the age of bottom up and, and the end of trickle down, Andres? I hope so. I, I certainly hope so. Hey, I'm thrilled with uh, being here with supporters, allies, friends, and hey, so many issues, so little time. So I'll add that perspective of uh, bottoms up um, uh, just to complement some of the things that we're saying here. Um, I, I would argue that the single best thing that we can do is to provide prosperity to those at the bottom of the income scale 
and to people of color. And, and Leo Strine made this point a few minutes ago. Um, what this basically calls for is to increase real wages by the lowest decile of workers, okay? Um, 48 years ago, an economist in the uh, Ford administration drew a, a graph in a napkin. Uh, Arthur Laffer was in a meeting with Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld in 74. And basically that graph argued that if you lower taxes, all sorts of good things happen, including more growth, and also more taxes would be collected. And then in the following years, a new religion grew, preaching low taxes, deregulation, absolute shareholder primacy, uh, de-unionization, uh, um, the so-called supply side economics, and it promised growth, right? And growth that will trickle down. And now over 40 years later, after the uh, religion became the religion of the land, so to speak, uh, we know that this experiment failed. We not only didn't get growth, but there was in fact no trickle down. Um, so I think that the economy is, is stuck in low gears. And with this, I, I, I have a different perspective than, than Leo. I think that we need more growth and some kind of very specific growth. Um, look, we uh, need large scale investments to invest in productive capacity so uh, workers at the bottom decile can not only increase their productivity, but in, in fact, be able to keep that productivity into real wages because so far capital has got the lion's share in the last four decades. Um, we do need more pie in that sense, right? Uh, we need massive investments. Um, Effectively, what we have right now is a system that has a lot of discrimination and inequalities, and that is stuck in, basically the system is stuck at low gear, so to speak. Uh, I think that the goal is to double wage growth at the bottom. In the last 20 years, it's been 0.5% real growth of, uh, you know, in wages. That's very, very low. So what, are, what, we, what I would say we need to do is double that to 1%, which has been what the top 10% have gotten, you know, and I think that the there's no sil silver bullet here, don't get me wrong, but I think that what we need to do to create space for these policies is to actually push for a lot more investments. And I think that these investments will actually uh, produce all kinds of uh, uh, benefits for folks at the bottom of the, of the earning scale. Um, basically three reasons. One is that a lot of these investments will benefit them directly, and this is pretty clear uh, in the last few months. Um, the second thing that will happen is it will create a lot of growth, and if history is of any guide, we know that uh, when we grow uh, close to full employment, that has been historically the only time that wages in the bottom actually go up. So that's a second effect that actually it's the historical pattern. And the third reason is that growth has wide appeal and has the potential to benefit mo most people. Of course, Leo is absolutely right that it hasn't in the last four decades, right? That's a big problem. But if you have growth, you have, you create the political space to make policies that need to happen more sustainable. And we avoid the zero sum politics that are so ugly, as we know now <laughs> with Trump and, 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 and similar faults around the world. Um, what we need is then to invest in this. Uh, we are seeing some evidence that this government-led investment actually leads private sector investment. We are starting to see actually a boom in private sector fixed uh, investment, which is kind of good news. Um, we need, of course, um, after that happens or while that happens, we need a suit of policies that address uh, disparate access and disparate outcomes in education and healthcare, in growth, uh, in jobs, in housing, in criminal justice. Because um, I think that we are stuck in low gear. A lot of this, I relate a lot to the conversation around income uncertainty. A lot of folks are stuck in a place where life throws a lot of uncertainties at you. 
And in that place, it's very, very difficult for folks to concentrate in, the, in their jobs. It's very difficult to make investments. And part of the solution is create a space where our certainties are actually gone. So let me pause there because there's a lot going on. Well, Back yeah, to thank, you, David. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Andres. And, and, and you sort of made the, the, the point um, that I was making, which was that we, we, we joked earlier on, I think last week on Twitter that, um, that invest, you know, we're, we're, we're speaking to investors who think that um, super empowered workers, rising wages, lifting up from the bottom is actually the best thing that can happen to, to capitalism and is the best thing that can happen to economic growth. And, um, and, and as you and, and others and Leo have, have said, you know, the share of that growth, the share of that increased productivity that goes to workers is really one of the key things to watch um, uh, because that will dri be driving this more equitable economy. Maybe the S in just a, a thing, we're thinking that, that what is the, the S in ESG or EES, EESG um, really is share the wealth. Absolutely. And it's, I, I don't think there's a trade-off there, right? Corporations really don't have, haven't had good ideas on where to invest, right? And, and that's a problem. If we create a more inclusive economy, there will be plenty of opportunities to invest and to grow. And that is music to shareholders, right? Um, that's something that we're stuck in low growth and very unequal growth because of inequality. Inequality is a driver for the sucky growth we have had. I mean, we used to grow at more than 3% in the US, 3.2%. Last 20 years, below 2%, 1.8%. That is not good for shareholders. Um, it's not good for the country and it creates all kinds of problems uh, for everyone involved. So this is something that shareholders uh, should embrace. And I believe they are investing. The, the, the ESG, uh, uh, investing is booming. There's all the evidence that that's the case. Uh, we just need a better apparatus, you know, regulatory, institutional, to let that capital sing and be allocated in, in ways that make sense for society. Ter terrific. Well, well um, let's, um, we're, 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 we're coming up on the hour. Like I said, we're going to um, hang in here a little bit. Um, obviously, if folks need to leave uh, at the hour, you know, feel free and, and don't, don't feel bad, bashful about that. But um, let's try to open it up a little bit. I first like to let the speakers, if there's anything that you heard from each other, um, uh, or, or Chris, um, if there's anything that you heard that you want to just call out, you know, briefly, and then while they're doing that, um, let's let's tee up some some questions. Um, Dennis, maybe you can help me pull anything that's happened on the chat. I haven't been able to really monitor that, and I know we have some uh, ringers in the audience who are itching to get into the conversation. So, um, is, just just give an opening to the speakers to sort of bounce off each other a little bit if there's something you want to add. Okay. I, I um, just appreciate that the conversation and this theme of needing to marry a different set of policies with acknowledgement of power. Like it's, it's this concert of policy and power and how do we shift power and wealth to those that have been excluded, build this bottom up economy, which is really the pathway to prosperity um, for all. Um, and then the, the role of this broader community to build that power, we need everybody involved. And so how can people in this community be they impact investors or advocacy organizations or folks working in business be part of pushing for these shifts? So it's been a great conversation. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I was going to uh, call out too. Is just the the, the 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 coming together of the folks on this call as a as a voice and a and a and a and a, and a power lobby at some level to to, art, to articulate this. Um, um, Delilah, I think you were teed up for for uh, jumping in here. So um, uh, Delilah Rothenberg. Sure, thanks David, and thanks everybody for this great program. Um, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with the pre-distribution initiative, uh, we're focused on issues really at the investment structure and um, capital structure level. And so uh, when Leo was talking about how a lot of the ESG issues that we see in portfolio companies actually stem from the pressures that investors put on them, that's really what we're looking at. So not just um, corporate governance interventions that uh, come from investors, but also how do you structure investments and um, what's the capital structure? And you know, if there's too much debt, that might be very difficult for a company to actually provide for quality jobs or you know, provide quality and affordability goods and services. 
So um, we're also a very proud grantee of Omidyar Network um, and thrilled to, to be here um, in this program that uh, Omidyar and Impact Alpha have curated and we're a signatory of the White House Initiative on Inclusive uh, Economic Growth. So I highly recommend other people check that out. I wanted to um, just do a quick call to action. Uh, there are, are a number of organizations that are coming together to support a task force on inequality related financial disclosures. And um, we're very uh, happy to be collaborating with PolicyLink on this and a number of other organizations on this call and off this call. And um, what that really is, is it's inspired by TCFD, but it's very different. Recognizing that inequality is something that impacts uh, people who have a voice and many people who have been marginalized. And so we're trying to build TCFD in a way that really centers the voices of the most marginalized, building it from the grassroots up as opposed to top down. Um, we're also looking at uh, you know, inside uh, out and outside in risks. TCFD really looks at outside in risks, what's climate doing to investors' uh, returns, but we're also looking at what do investors and companies uh, do to impact inequality and trying to measure and manage that in a way that takes into account planetary boundaries and social norms. So we really have context-based uh, thresholds and targets. So I um, highly encourage everybody to check that out, get involved. I'll put a link in the chat and uh, interested in, in what everybody else is working on and wants to share. Well, um, uh, I don't know. This is this is the part of the of the class, you guys, where I cold call on some of you that I know are out there. <laughs> so um, uh, I've been chatting with um, Melissa Melissa Bradley at eighteen sixty three Ventures about this sort of interesting statistics that are coming up out of the uh, out of the the data around um, uh, new business starts and small business starts in the pandemic and um, and and entrepreneurship. Melissa, are you? Um, I, don't, I can't get everybody on my screen, so I can't quite see you. I am you? here. There you are. <laughs> um, um, I just wanted to see if you, you know you you've been both the policy side and the investment side, um, and and watching you know this entrepreneurship uh, phenomena as a as a sort of economic strategy. I mean, how to turn this momentary blip? You know, you, you tell me what it is into into a into a sustained into a sustained trend. Yeah, well, it's good to see so many familiar faces um, on the call. And there's a couple of things I'll say. I'll address the entrepreneurship and then I'll be quick because I know we're running out of time. I, you know, I think entrepreneurship from in, within the Black community has always been there. Hence, we just celebrated the 100 year anniversary of Tulsa. And I think that post COVID and certainly post George Floyd, there has been a reckoning when you look at the number of corporate resignations, particularly amongst black and brown women, just speaks to the fact that we are done with assuming that institutions will make a change for us. And so as I sit in this, this conversation, I'm optimistic as the academic and someone who has worked in this space for a long time, but it also raises a lot of questions because as we work with entrepreneurs and I do that in a variety of roles, there is this question of what is the practical, what is the strategic, and what is the political small p. And I think what I've heard today are some amazing ambitious things, but one of the things that, maybe this is because I'm an academic, when I think about an article that was probably written about three, four years ago by uh, SSIR, they said that, um, you know, systems change is happens on a large scale, changing the way a majority of relevant players solve a big social change such that a critical mass of people affected by the problem substantially benefit. One of my concerns around these policies is that it was not until we recognized that there has been the majority of black women are the primary entrepreneurs and not white men, did policies and the allocation of capital start to change. If we continue to create policies that go for the majority, then I'm not included because I'm still only 12% of the population. And so I did not disagree with anything that I heard, but I have seen if we look at PPP, Amazing program, but totally missed the community because we are not always at scale to be able to receive this. You see the mismatch of corporate contributions that were made by people like Netflix and PayPal where they couldn't even get the money out. And so I love the policies, but I think there has to be the strategy around how do we build up these institutions so they can actually be the recipients and beneficiaries. And we begin to break the challenge that I can't get invited to certain places or Nobody in the boardroom looks like me to make these decisions. And so we have to say, yes, system change is one thing, just basic practical strategy. And the other thing is individual. I know this field. Uh, I only see Michael and myself and maybe a few other people of color. That is a fundamental problem. And I'll remember, maybe 
I've known Fran for a while. When I was running Tides, they gave a talk at our conference called Momentum and said, the only thing this way this works is if people have the power willing to give it up. And I haven't seen any policy or anybody willing to give the power except the head of the Dallas Mavericks, who was a white man and stepped down and said, I need, I'm sorry, Dallas Wings, I need a black woman to run this team. So I, having worked in Clinton and Obama, I am all about the policies, but if they are not human centered on people who look like me and not the people who create them, I fear that what, two years from now, this is all for naught. So I think we've got to have individual solutions that focus on the people who look like me, strategies that are practical, and then those should be concretized in policy, not policy that is top down and no one's ever talked to me or talked to more importantly, because I'm pretty damn privileged, but I haven't really talked to the people that you really want to impact. So I'm excited by this conversation, but I'm, my, my ulcer is a little ticking because I'm like, now what? And most importantly, where am I? Thank you, Melissa. Um, uh, a lot of plus ones coming up on the, t on the chat. Um, uh, like I said, that we're at the we're at the hour, but we're gonna we're gonna keep rolling. So again, um, just hang with us if you can, and and, and feel free to leave if you if you have to. Um, um, is there anybody um, who uh, has been waiting to get in? I, I, like I said, it's hard to see all the screens at once, so I can't see anybody sort of raising their hand. But if you want to just pop in now, um, uh, uh, or or pop a question into the chat, Dennis, have you been monitoring? Are there actual questions in the chat? There's a lot of I know a lot of. Uh, uh, resource sharing and stuff, but are there questions that are emerging? There, there's something I'd like to add, I think that hasn't been uh, completely discussed yet. And that is, you know, a lot of times we separate policy and government in, in the public office from the, the private sector and the, in the business um, sector. And I think, you know, we've really seen that disconnect during COVID, for instance, and there's been a lot of businesses that have suffered and there's been a disconnect between policy and business. But I think in general, you know, I follow innovation, innovation and business, and I've always seen a huge disconnect with public policy accommodating innovation and the design structure of, you know, how our government or policy is built relative to what businesses need. So I think there's a real need to, to have businesses and, you know, impact, and not just impact, impact is innovation and innovation is impact in my mind, and have that uh, ladder up to creating change that accommodates that innovation and impact. I mean, that's kind of what I see. I mean, a lot of times we separate those two, but the, the true private public partnerships create um, not just policy change, but but practical, pragmatic change. I mean, I've seen, right. you know, new, for instance, smart cities is a combination. That's just one example. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis, is there anything? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. The role of tax policy has come up uh, multiple times in the, in, the, in the stakeholder economy. Um, a few folks want to know if anyone has insights on the uh, upcoming initiatives of the business roundtable. Um, and then mechanisms to sort of nudge or force in institutional investors to um, support companies that are supporting workers um, are some of them. But maybe, maybe if anyone had thoughts on the tax policy, I think taxes. Tax policy. You know, it's it's a you can't you can't can't escape it. I mean, um, uh, uh, pay pay your fair share of taxes might be one of the first things on your your ESG uh, on your ESG score, um, Leo or, or or anybody else. Andres, oh, there's Leo. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm laying on my back because I have a pinched nerve, but um, I, I think, gang, taxes are important. I, I love President Biden. I kind of think they put themselves a little bit in the box with the 400K K limit, which, um, you know, they won't do any taxes if it hits anyone below $400,000 a year. And I think as we move along, they need to think about the nature of taxes. I think something like an FTT would be very helpful and it would be very helpful to longer term investors uh, because if everybody had to pay, have a little pricing friction, it would help the investors who are thinking long term. FTT, also, financial transaction tax? Exactly. And it would take some also, it would um, reduce some of the influence of high frequency traders. And I think if you looked at a, of FTT and some form of a carbon tax, 
you're also talking about the kind of taxes that could go along, could go OECD wide, along with the anti-tax haven initiative by the president. And then I think you're starting to think about something that's virtuous, uh, David, because there's not as much arbitrage uh, between nations. But I think, I think that you really do have to think differently, and I hope the administration does, about things like income taxes than about things that are more like sales taxes. And I think there is a big difference between people who make 150 to 400,000 and you know, the middle class. The middle class in this country is less than 100,000. And you, know, you do need a broad enough tax base to pay for society. I think there's another thing I would say that corporations have systematically exempted themselves from school taxes in the United States over the last 50 years. And they talk about the public education system, but the first thing they do whenever they want to keep a plant somewhere or, or located elsewhere is to ask for exemptions. And I think this whole idea of you can't be a good citizen without paying your taxes um, would be quite a useful thing. Um, uh, James, you have your hand up. Yes. Well, to tag off Leo, uh, you know, one thing I, so I file a lot of shareholder proposals. I filed 90 last year and I'm also suing the SEC so that I can continue to uh, file shareholder proposals because they tried to clamp down on that. But uh, so we filed a shareholder proposal at Yelp uh, that got almost 12% of the vote. That's, that's a start anyway, to convert to a public benefit company. So all these companies are coming out, you know, the, uh, Business Roundtable, like, came out with these statements about how they're putting, you know, they're going to put stakeholders first, and so, and like communities and taxes and workers and all that, and actually, uh, shareholders were at the bottom of their list uh, in their st in their statement. So I think this is a way to hold their feet to the fire. Okay, if you really want to. Uh, act like a public benefit company, why don't you actually convert legally to become a public benefit company? So anyway, that's one strategy, uh, but I'm yeah, happy to work with a anybody. story last week on, 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 on conversions to public benefit corporations, which used to be considered, you know, maybe a no-go zone and then starting to happen with, with, with a couple now. So, it, and, and shareholders don't seem to be rebelling. Um, um, uh, so it is possible. James, one, one follow-up for you. What, what's the next step with a company like Yelp and knowing they they passed the threshold, you know, wasn't probably maybe higher than you expected, but not as much as was needed. What's the next step with a company like that? Well, I think refiling, refiling the proposal. I mean, it's plenty enough to refile next year, but we could also come in with other proposals uh, going after after other aspects that are kind of hypocritical at Yelp. So, uh, mm. I and I excuse me, but you know, basically. I used to be a public policy person and, you know, we used to work at the, in the Capitol and all that, but, uh, you know, now I'm very much focused on shareholder proposals because I see that as a very practical mechanism. So. Um, I'm, I'm scrolling through to see whether any other folks who, who mentioned that they wanted to jump in or, or particularly, uh, are particularly are on. And so I'm, I'm. Carl, I'm Carl's got his hand up. Okay. Carl. Yeah. Carl. You got, you're muted though. Yeah, there you go. Okay, all right, thanks. So a constant theme here is fairness, how to improve it. Andre made some interesting uh, remarks about uh, the importance of a vibrant economy in fostering more opportunity. And, and there's a lot of good things that can happen out of that. The question I'd like people to kind of weigh in on is, the role of competition, world competition on the ability to attain some of these business related goals. Um, competition is, is, is something that encourages companies to do, do cut back on things. And, and, and we're in a more competitive type of economy worldwide. So I guess the question is, how do you toggle, how do you balance the desire for fairness versus the need to, if you believe in vibrancy as, as an important uh, way to advance fairness, uh, how, do you, how do you preserve that? Because in a way, it, I, I think some of the collective remarks 
sound a bit more like European type capitalism. And European capitalism hasn't demonstrated itself to be that vibrant. It's been more fair. So it seems like there's a, a seesaw here that's difficult to, to navigate. So you're saying Especially you're saying anti antitrust and, and other anti-monopoly policies could not necessarily if it if it ripens to a legal argument, it, it's going to be against sellers offshore who are who are not buying into the same fairness compact with workers and customers. So it would be a dumping type of, of thing. But le legal, I'm not, I'm not sure how uh, um, dynamic that type of response would be. But, but it's sort of like, hey, if, if, if you want to raise the level of um, corporate responsibility and, and, and recognizing there's lots of stakeholders here, how do you encourage them to do that when they're getting hit by cheap products from abroad. Gotcha, gotcha. More race, race to the top as opposed to race to the bottom. Christopher, you have your hand up too, so let's let's get you in here. I don't know if you, I don't, your, your video is not on, so maybe you're, oh, you're, you're, you're muted as well. All right, Christopher, if you unmute, I don't know if you're trying to speak, but you're muted. David, could I, yeah. could I just weigh in with one perspective that relates to some of what we just shared, if that's all right? Hello. Um, oh, Christopher's oh, Christopher is back, so please, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Christopher Wilson, and I'm a founding share member and holder of Derrick Automotive. Um, we are an African-American owned company, and we have the first um, class one and class two De electric delivery vehicles that we're now in the process of doing our pre-sales um, event. And what we're trying to do is reach unicorn status. Our class one and class two vehicles get 250 miles per gallon and have a range of 2000 miles on 10 gallons of standard gas. What we do is our engine actually charges the battery. There's no reason to hook up to an electrical outlet. You can actually hook it up to your house or your business if need be and act as a backup generator for your business. We're doing a grassroots ground level approach to small minority and women owned businesses to give them the first opportunity to have this paradigm shift because we have orders from Ryder, we have orders from other people. We could have went to Amazon, but we didn't because it was important that we do the equity building as you're saying from the ground up and make a real difference and a real impact like you do at Impact Alpha. <laughs> nice, thank you. <laughs> if anybody is, has any interest in following up and finding out more information and seeing how you can become a part of this and become a part of a real impact movement, along with the things that you're already doing and see what we're doing, along with our returning citizens program, where we help convicts returning from incarceration start their own business to refit our commercial vans. So they have already built in customers because we're actually getting the customers and they're redoing the vans and we're helping them start their own business. So they have no reason to have to go back to the life that they were leading. Nice, why don't you, Mike, if, if you haven't, uh, Christopher, put your contact in the, in, the, in the text channel. Absolutely, thanks a lot, David. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Michael, you were, you, you, were, you were next, I think. Thanks, David. Um, hi, everyone. Um, just connecting the dots. I'm based in Toronto, Canada, looking across what's happening in the UK, which I think is taking a further, faster approach with the Better Business Act, um, 600 plus businesses. Um, I'll just post it in the chat. Um, but I'm just thinking back to some of the comments, uh, conversions of uh, publicly traded uh, US companies uh, towards public benefit corporations, several Shareholder resolutions have failed in that regard, uh, including with several of the business roundtable members. So the question, um, is there a member amongst the business roundtable or a coalition of the willing that's actually prepared to step up on PCB conversion uh, with shareholder support? And what does it look like to get an equivalent to the Better Business Act in uh, the US alongside my bringing it to Canada in the next little while? Thank you. Just if people, I think people know, but when people talk about PBC or public benefit corporations, that's a, a, a corporate structure. I think it's in something like 44 states here 
um, that allows you to enshrine your commitments to the stakeholders or and 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 uh, and, and other kinds of governance. Uh, processes into your actual corporate charter so that sh stake shareholders know what they're getting and and frankly can't sue you if you if you take into account other other stakeholders as well so um public benefit corporations sometimes called benefit corporations um uh yangbo you're 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 still muted ah uh, great uh it's fine so we want to address a couple of um, points uh, that were raised so one to carl's point about the flavors of capitalism you find in Europe, uh, the response there is just don't be afraid to mix and match. Uh, you're probably going to get something that would look quite uh, different, even if you adopt from uh, methods from practices elsewhere. So, for example, you, if there are attributes that you find about the systems in place in uh, France or Germany, these areas, especially Germany with the cooperative banking, a co termination. You could adopt that without necessarily having to also adopt some of the uh, negatives and say, for example, the United States, we've been leading in uh, tech startups and software for so long, uh, we don't have to sacrifice that. Uh, and at the same time, we can adopt whatever uh, Germany has. So that's one. And then uh, secondly is um, really to put out the messaging. So I'm seeing uh, Paloma mothers sharing what's been going on multilaterally around issues about uh, wealth, uh, tax, uh, anti-monopoly policy, and the messaging that needs to be uh, clear, and it's something that even the former director at uh, one of the agencies with a tax shelter um, in Jersey or Jersey, one of those two, and Nicholas Jackson, I share a link to that, but uh, he basically makes the argument that even if the UK, for example, were to act unilaterally and call bluff, and this applies to any country, and call bluff any of the companies threatening to invert or leave or do whatever to avoid higher tax burden, it's actually unilaterally beneficial given that those companies were being extractive in terms of impact on uh, local economies anyways. If you take London, for example, compared to boroughs, city of London, Hackney, Hackney, 41% cut overall in funding per resident, per household over the past decade, thanks to austerity measures, even at the same time while you're getting high capital flows in the city of London. So quite clear that it's definitely not trickling down whatever is flowing in from favorable tax policy. And Ditto Ireland that if you remember uh, 2014, there was a sudden adjustment in their GDP that said, well, the GDP just increased by 40 or 60% or something. Well, had no material impact on ground just because some large companies changed their accounting rules. So more of their profits, more of their income get realized in Ireland. So just a couple points like to address there before turning over to uh, many uh, respondents. Thank, thank you, Yangbo. Um, as we're, we're 20 minutes around here, I just wanna make sure that any, um, I think some of the speakers have had to to, to kick off. Um, Chris, do you want to sort of just give a any any kind of final word here, and then I, like I say, I'll I'll retreat into the background and let folks hang out for a little bit. But maybe we can bring the sort of formal uh, part to a close. And is there some kind of call to action or or just sort of takeaways that you want to wrap up with? Oh, thanks, David. Um, thanks to our our speakers for 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 their remarks. Thanks to Impact Alpha for curating. This conversation, thanks to this whole audience for engaging. I feel like there's um, strong and violent agreement on the the shifts we need to to move to reimagined capitalism. Um, a plethora of opportunities to make those shifts um, in in policy change as we frame this conversation, but in the the power building we need to really root the policy change agenda in um, uh, in in communities. Um, that need to advance in this economy and have been held back. Um, and encouragingly, um, lots of opportunities for action. So I encourage folks to reach out and tap into the resources um, shared throughout this conversation uh, and in the, in the chat, um, get involved in things like the White House Initiative on Inclusive Economic Growth or the, the Task Force on Inequality Related Disclosures uh, and it's, it's, it's encouraging, inspiring to see the energy from this community to push towards the structural changes we need in this economy. And uh, Omidyar Network hopes to play 
um, a small role in partnership with all of you in, in advancing this change. So please reach out to us as well if you see opportunities to partner. Terrific, terrific. I want to I want to thank uh, thank all the speakers and, and and Chris. Thank you and the Omidyar Network and um, and say that we've been. Um, uh, working these, you know, some of these these storylines for a while, and there's a lot of uh, depth on Impact Alpha. You can find that we have actually have a uh, a new landing page. You can find under Beats at the, on the site called Policy Corner, where all this stuff is has been kind of rounded up. Um, uh, thanks in part to the, um, the 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 Impact Investing Alliance, which Fran is with, um, and we're going to have another call later in the summer, we're not sure of the date yet, um, to go even deeper on, on, on policy. So we'll be doing more on policy and then we'll also have um, future calls um, around uh, uh, capitalism reimagined. And, and kind of to the point that Melissa made and I think was, 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 was apparent, um, uh, we also have a series of calls and, and other activities and podcasts, as you know, coming up under what we call the reconstruction, which is squarely on this um, racial equity, racial justice, racial justice investing agenda. Um, so all of those things are sort of parts of the same story, you know, broader story. And, and we're on the case and we invite you to obviously um, uh, uh, read up on, on Impact Alpha um, and, and, and join us on all those calls and, and listen to the podcasts and whatnot. As I said, I'm gonna kind of, maybe I'll even turn my screen off, but I'm gonna stick around and you guys can stick around and anybody can just kind of chime in. So um, now would be the time to, to jump in, but I'm gonna um, uh, take leave here. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, David. I just wanted to get a quick comment in, and I typed it into the uh, the notes that uh, I've learned so much from so many of the people that I see were here today. And uh, really, thank you for putting together such a fine group of, of people on such an important subject. Uh, in particular, Carl and Amy, I want to reach out to both of you for your great work in this space as well. I've enjoyed your reading, and uh, thank you for that. We uh, at National Commonwealth Group, which was uh, founded, and our executive director is also on the call, Michael Savant. Uh, we've put together an initiative called the Sustainable Communities Framework, and it incorporates so many of the issues that we're discussing today. Uh, SCF.green is that URL. If you want to go, we'd welcome anyone's uh, comments and support. Uh, we believe we've, we've uh, answered a, a way to turn the discussion away from shareholder to stakeholder, and we really welcome your comments. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to want to want to want to uh, ju jump in? We'll hold we'll hold the room, you know, for a couple of minutes, and then and then we'll let everybody go to their rest of their day. For everyone that was asking, we will have the call recording available next week, so you can be on the lookout for that in the brief um, sometime next week. So, and also I posted in there the link where you can listen to some of our past calls if you'd like to catch up on that as well. Will the call?